Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks so much for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really privileged to be joined by Nicole Perlroff, who is a cybersecurity reporter for the New York Times and the author of a terrific and terrifying book, which is called This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends. It's an amazingly interesting and rich book, which we are going to discuss uh, at some length. Uh, Nicole is a native of San Francisco. She went to undergrad at Princeton, graduate work at uh, Stanford, uh, and she's been a reporter for the New York Times for about a decade, uh, based largely out of the San Francisco uh, Bureau there. So Nicole, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much everyone for tuning in to what I'm sure is your 1000th uh, Zoom seminar. Hopefully we can do this in person soon, but it's great to be with you. Great. Well, thank you. Well, Nicole, in your book, you, you, you talk about uh, you know, your background. You had been a, a writer for, I think it was uh, uh, Forbes magazine, doing largely profiles of Silicon Valley venture capitalists, you know, doing uh, magazine articles. The New York Times heard about you, approached you. And to your surprise, they started uh, floating the idea of a cybersecurity beat. Tell us about your initial uh, surprise at that offer. So, yes, you know, I had been covering venture capitalists. This was, I'd started really when venture capital was still in the doldrums, but then with sort of the escalation of the valuations in companies like Facebook and Twitter on these private exchanges, these venture capitalists who were down on their luck now suddenly seemed like celebrities. And so I was covering them for the cover of Forbes magazine. And really these, this was a human story. And so, yes, I got a call from the New York Times tech editor and he said, we're looking at you for this job, but it's, uh, we're not sure you're going to want it. And I said, well, how bad could it be? You're the New York Times. I'll take whatever it is. <laughs> and they said, it's cybersecurity. So I remember going to my interviews at the New York Times, which are very intense. They do these kind of 13, 30 minute interviews with different uh, segments of the paper, usually editors, but also the food critic and, you know, all these different people. And I remember telling myself, I have to be very clear with everyone who's interviewing me, that not only do I not know anything about cybersecurity, I've actively gone out of my way not to learn anything about cybersecurity. And I even came with a list and I said, here's a list of cybersecurity reporters who seem to be doing a great job. I, I highly recommend you look at them and they said, you don't understand. We've, we've interviewed many of the people on your list. We had no idea what they're talking about. You're hired. <laughs> and so began my illustrious entry to the New York Times. But I think what they were clearly looking for was someone who could translate this very technical space that was growing in importance for the lay reader. And I think even then, what they were hoping I would do because the tech desk is under the business desk is that I would cover the business of cybersecurity, the semantics and the McAfee's and their earnings reports and that kind of thing. But very quickly, it became clear that there was something much bigger going on. And that was the fact that companies, businesses in the United States and journalists too, were being expected now to defend themselves from nation state hackers, nation state level cyber threats. And so one of the first things that happened was the Times was hacked by China. Someone on the security team tipped me off and I went and actually embedded with them almost under cover of darkness uh, for several months. And I didn't tell my colleagues what I was doing. Um, one managing editor knew and had signed off on it. And then to the Times credit, I ended up publishing the story of what a Chinese attack on an American business or in this case, a news organization looked like. Uh, the sort of day in, day out, rummaging through our network. And in our case, it was in search of our sources. But I remember we were very afraid that they were trying to shut down our print process, potentially in front of an election. And so just to see this guy we called the Beijing summer intern roll into our networks at 9.30 a.m. Beijing time and roll out every day at 5.30 a.m. Beijing time was such a wake up call and really ended up informing everything I did next. Well, it's interesting in your book, I mean, you kind of describe how you, you assembled this beat. And one of the things is, is attending a lot of conferences. And, um, and, uh, and it was interesting because, I mean, these conferences, you know, are in, in exotic places, you know, Buenos Aires, Miami, et cetera. 
but you talk about it as being kind of a, uh, a kind of a strange community. I want to read a couple sentences and just have you riff off it. You said, ponytailed hackers mingled with lawyers, tech executives, bureaucrats, intelligence operatives, revolutionaries, cryptographers, and the occasional undercover agent. Tell us what it's like to go to one of these conferences, and, and particularly as a reporter who people are probably a little bit wary of. Yes, I mean, the, the phrasing you just read was about the annual DEF CON black hat hacking conferences in Las Vegas every year, which I likened a little bit to the most Eisley Cantina in, in Star Wars. You know, it's just this crazy mix of people. You just listed them. And what struck me was that, uh, you know, it was really a meritocracy. You know, these were all people who, in one way, shape, or form, were trying to improve our cybersecurity in a lot of cases for very different reasons. And so it always struck me that you would see the head of the FBI's cyber division mingling with someone who is a privacy activist that used to be a hacker that, you know, may have spent some time, uh, you know, talking to some policemen or <laughs> something, you know, some murkiness in their background. But the reality was we have such, and to this day, we have such a talent shortage when it comes to cybersecurity professionals. There's something like a 3 million person deficit uh, of people who are, who are able and willing to work in cybersecurity positions. And the people who know the most about this space uh, came into it for very passionate reasons, or maybe they came in through law enforcement. And at a certain point, it just struck me that they all knew each other. And so there I am in these sort of bars in Las Vegas with the people you just described as a reporter, as a woman, you know, there weren't many women in this space. Um, if there were, they were really there from a policy perspective. And so you were just this total outsider and just trying to get people to talk to you was a huge challenge. You know, law enforcement doesn't want to talk to a reporter. Um, Hackers don't really want to talk to someone who's not very technical. Uh, you know, it, the list goes on and on. Some privacy activists, I remember approaching them and they would say things like, I don't talk to the New York Times after X and X story, you know. So it was this huge challenge and it really took me several years to feel comfortable at those conferences and to get to a point where I could understand where everyone was coming from and that at the end of the day, all of us really had a common objective, which was solving our cyber, cyber predicament and privacy predicament and security predicament. But the problem kept getting worse at the same time. You know, the stakes kept going up. We were plugging in our critical infrastructure online without thinking about how it could potentially be used against us. And more and more nation states, not just China, we're getting into this game and hacking the United States for very different reasons. And so as the years progressed, we all got to know each other very well. Well, you, I, just uh, one conference you were talking about it in Miami, you said, nobody wanted me there. They tried to disinvite me twice. <laughs> and then yes. it, I guess this was when the word had gotten out that you were writing this book. And, and then you said that you would see people where they kind of studiously avoiding you and looking the other way when you, so you needed a kind of a thick skin, I suspect. Huh? Exactly. And you know, that Miami conference was, is really kind of the equivalent of a cyber arms bazaar. You know, this is the conference in Miami every year um, held by a company that deals in finding vulnerabilities and exploiting them, usually for defense, but a lot of the people they work with and a lot of the hackers they know find those vulnerabilities and exploit them and sell them to governments for offense. And so at that particular conference, it's known as really an offense type conference. And so there's a lot of people from the NSA. There's a lot of people from sort of the NSA equivalent around the world. And then there are also government representatives and their intermediaries who are there to potentially buy these exploits that they can add to their stockpiles for counterintelligence programs or potentially battlefield programs. So when the conference organizers heard, I wanted to write a book about this market, you know, this government backed market for cyber vulnerabilities, they said, you're not coming. We don't want you to come. And I basically said, listen, I've already bought my ticket 
<laughs> I've already booked my hotel stay. If you don't want to give me the conference discount, that's fine. But I'm going to be at this hotel during your conference. Either I'm going to be lurking around the pool <laughs> or I'm going to be inside listening to your panelists and introducing myself in a formal capacity. So I show up. And they hand me my registration badge, but they also hand me a neon green glow stick. And that's what they made me wear for the duration of the conference to tell everyone that I was PNG, I was the journalist, and that they were not to talk to me. <laughs> and so it was just, you know, I just, I, I, I laugh still when I think back to that neon green glow stick, because it was basically a dog collar. And they were basically saying, everyone stay away from her. And so, yeah, that was the most... Um, most uncomfortable, I guess I would say, I felt at any conference. Well, Nicole, let's talk about just a couple of kind of definitional terms. And you, you, you made reference to the, what you call zero days. What would you, for our audience that maybe is not as, as, as nuanced in this, tell us briefly what a zero day is. So I promise this is the most technical part of our conversation today in, in all likelihood. But a zero day, and just to make it easy is, it's a flaw in code that the manufacturer doesn't know exists. So they haven't patched for it. So let's just take your iPhone. If I'm a hacker and I find a flaw in your iOS, your iPhone's iOS mobile software, Apple doesn't know about it. And I can write a code to exploit that. That flaw is called a zero day because Apple doesn't know about it. The program I write to exploit it is called a zero day exploit. And zero day exploits come in all sorts of flavors, but the one you really want is the one that would allow me to spy on your iPhone without you having to do a single thing, click on a link or a text message or an email or anything. And if I can do that, I could potentially write a program to read your text messages or track your location or access your video or audio feeds without you knowing about it, record your phone calls, your, see your contacts, all that kind of thing. And so you could see why that zero day exploit for your iPhone software would have incredible value to an authoritarian government for surveillance, to the United States and its intelligence agencies for counterintelligence or tracking a terrorist or drug mule or that kind of thing. And so there is a growing market for zero days. And it's, it's become rather sophisticated over the past decade in particular, but there are now companies like Zerodium, which is based around the Beltway, that has a website, a public website, it's not even on the dark web, that says, here are the prices we will pay you if you turn over one of these zero-day exploits. And the, the mother load is a zero-day exploit for Android these days, for your Android phones. And then just below that is for your iPhone, the, the zero day exploit I described earlier. And they'll pay you $3 million for an Android zero day exploit or $2.5 million for an iPhone exploit. And the caveat, caveat is that you, the hacker, if you're going to do that, the only thing is you can never tell Apple about it because the, or, or Google about it in, in Android's case, because the minute you do, those companies will patch the underlying flaw in that $2.5 million investment that this company just made turns to dust. Now those companies work with several government agencies. If they're based in the Beltway, you can pretty much guarantee they're working for US intelligence agencies, potentially law enforcement like the FBI that would have an interest in getting into terrorist phones or people they suspect of being terrorists or drug, drug cartels, et cetera. The DEA would all have a vested interest in this. Um, but also they, they most likely these days sell to our five eyes intelligence partners, which are the five English speaking nations like the UK and New Zealand and Australia and Canada that also have a vested interest in these tools. But the other thing that was happening was other governments were opening up their eyes to the potential for zero day exploit to help them with their own surveillance and counterintelligence operations. So in the course of researching my book, I actually uncovered this one zero day broker that's based in Abu Dhabi called CrowdFence that I learned serves exclusively uh, uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis. And they're already outbidding us. They're already paying uh, hackers uh, half a million dollars more for that Android exploit and half a million dollars more for that iOS exploit. So we're already getting outbid in this market. And really what struck me was the fact that governments, and this is really the basic 
question I was trying to solve for my book, or at least understand better was, wait a minute, governments are paying hackers potentially all over the world to find flaws in the software that we all use as Americans and keep them vulnerable in the event they need to spy on someone. You know, maybe that was okay two decades ago when different countries were using different technologies, right? China was using Huawei, we were using Cisco firewalls and that kind of thing. So if we found a zero day exploit for Huawei, of course we didn't want Huawei knowing about it because we could use that to spy not just on our Chinese adversaries, but potentially other countries that relied on that software like North Korea and Iran, countries that are not so easily surveilled. The problem is these days with Huawei is still a glaring exception and there's been a lot of US lobbying <laughs> to prevent American businesses and Americans and our allies, our closest allies from using Huawei systems. But for the most part, we're all using the same software. We're all using Androids and iPhones and Microsoft Windows. And not only that, but we're baking Windows software into our power grid and our water treatment facilities and our hospitals. So when the US government finds a zero day or acquires a zero day in those systems from hackers, it logically follows that they're leaving Americans much less safe. So that was the moral hazard I sought to explore, particularly as the stakes were getting higher. And I could see from my perch at the New York Times, just running from fire to fire here, that other governments were really starting to wrap their resources and pouring a lot more money into their own offensive cyber programs, into stockpiling their own zero day exploits and using them on American systems. And so that, that suggested that, you know, if the US government found a zero day for your iPhone and didn't tell Apple about it, it was very possible and, and, and increasingly so that China might find that same flaw and use it to spy on Americans or American government employees or, or journalists. Um, and so that ended up being, you know, I, I really wanted to focus on the zero day market because to me, I was just fascinated by sort of the moral and I guess security dilemmas baked into that market and those decisions. Well, Nicole, probably the institution that kind of looms largest in your book is the NSA, which is something maybe most Americans are not that familiar with. Um, so tell us a little bit about the NSA and also a, a, a kind of a later entity called Cyber Command, which is based in the Pentagon, because these are the two major American entities that are involved in this realm. Yeah, so... You know, most people feel like they probably learned a lot about the NSA from the Snowden revelations. Um, and I, I was brought into some of those projects. Uh, we, we partnered with The Guardian and ProPublica on some of the, the document. We got access to the documents from Snowden and wrote several stories off of them. But to me, one major problem with the Snowden documents was there wasn't a lot of context. I mean, you're talking about documents where it's just code name for everything. You spent, you know, I spent three months looking at this one word buckshot without any definition or context in the documents explaining what buckshot actually was. And it was really through a process of osmosis over several months that I finally could wrap my head around what I was seeing. Um, you know, jargon everywhere. No, no, there's nothing that doesn't have a code word really when it comes to US intelligence agencies. And it was really hard to understand, you know, what the NSA was doing, let alone what the context was around it. So the reason the NSA became sort of one of the main characters in my book was that they were the first US intelligence agency to see the value of a zero day for counterintelligence, you know, to spy on our adversaries, to spy on terrorists, which is essentially their mission, right? Um, and at first they had the best and brightest of, uh, you know, American engineers and, and cryptographers and mathematicians to pursue these programs. Uh, so they didn't have to play in this market. They didn't really have to acquire zero days from hackers, at least initially. It was really some of the other intelligence agencies that didn't have the resources or the talent pool of the NSA, like the CIA or the DEA or the FBI that, that was playing in this market. That's what I learned from my book research, but now they do. Now they do um, budget 
uh, money to pay outside hackers and defense contractors to turn over zero day exploits and never tell a soul. <clears throat> so the goal of my book really was to explore this zero day market, every slice of it, but in a very human way, you know, and sort of just to bring it back in the same way I was telling the story of Silicon Valley's venture capital through humans, through these profiles. I wanted to do the same for the zero day market because if someone goes to a bookstore and they say, you know, you know, see a book that says, this is about the zero day market. No one's going to buy it. <laughs> their eyes are going to roll to the back of their heads if they just start reading about the market. But to me, it was a very human story that was, you know, had all of these moral hazards and security dilemmas baked in. So it was really important to me to structure the book uh, where every chapter would focus on sort of one character that you could tell the story of that slice of the market through. And my main, main anxiety in doing this book is what am I going to do when I get to the NSA? Who is going to be the person that represents the NSA's space in this market? Who is actually going to talk to me? And thank God, I ended up finding a guy named Jim Gosler. And the way I found him was really serendipitously. I was at work one day sitting at my desk ruining the fact that I should have never signed on to do this book in this really hard space. What was I thinking? And I was never going to find anyone at the NSA who would talk. And my predecessor at the New York Times, John Markoff, who'd covered cybersecurity for a long time, said, oh, well, why don't you just find the godfather of American cyber war? And I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. He said, there's this guy that everyone calls the, the godfather of American cyber war. I forget his name. Gossler something, Google it. I'm sure you can find him. <laughs> and lo and behold, I, after like three weeks of Googling, I find this guy, Jim Gossler. And, you know, I have access to amazing people through my work. So I just started asking them the last question at every interview, you know, people who led some of these agencies. Now, if you had to name one person who was the godfather of American cyber war, who would you say? And they all said Jim Gossler. So Jim Gosler um, really became sort of the human vehicle through which I could discuss the NSA's involvement in these programs and offer that critical context that I thought was missing from the Snowden documents. And what he told me was nothing classified, but what he said was to understand these programs and the United States role in the zero day market and, and developing cyber weapons, et cetera, you really have to go back to the Cold War and you need to go find this report that had recently been declassified called Project Gunman. And what Project Gunman was, was a classified effort during the Reagan administration to find a bug in uh, the systems at the US embassy in Moscow. So we had been tipped off by the French that they had found a bug in their machines and that we should assume the same. And by that point, we did assume, based on some of our own intelligence, that somehow the Soviets were capturing all of our communications at the embassy, written and unwritten, and we didn't understand how this was happening. So Project Gunman was the effort to go get every single piece of equipment that you plug into a wall at the embassy, get it back to Fort Meade, the NSA's headquarters, without any tampering or interference by the Soviets to potentially remove their bug analyze it, find the bug, replace all that equipment with uh, new equipment that had not been tampered with. And they were given six months to do this. The NSA was given six months. So they bring all the equipment, equipment back and it's you know crypto gear and it's these teleprinters, things you send telegrams with, um, and also typewriters and all, all of those things. And it took almost the full six months before they found the most sophisticated bug they had ever seen, which was buried in the back coil of a typewriter. And really what it was, was this highly sophisticated implant that measured every last magnetic disturbance from every key, key written stroke on those typewriters, cataloged it, and then sent it to a radio listening unit that the Soviets had hidden in the embassy's chimney. And that's how they were capturing all of our unencrypted communications. You know, they didn't have to go break the encryption. This is how they could get it all in plain text before it was encrypted. And so once we discovered that, what Jim Kostler told me was that was the big aha moment that, you know, that before that we were fundamentally clueless. 
And after that, once we discuss, once Project Gunman was complete, we realized that unless we attacked every single new piece of technology that came on the market and was used by our adversaries, we would not only lose the Cold War in the short term, term but we would never win a war in the future because we would be missing critical intelligence. And so starting that year, 1984, I think is when we discovered it, for the last you know, three, four, almost four decades, uh, we have been attacking, the NSA has been attacking every new piece of technology and finding a way to implant itself in that technology so that it can gather our enemies and potential terrorist communications in, in unencrypted form. Um, and so that was really what he told me was, this is the story of the NSA that we learned from our enemy. And this is where we are. But the reason he talked to me about this was because by the time I reached him in 2015 for the first time, he had <clears throat> spent so much time leading these organizations through this transition at NSA. And then he led an office at the CIA. It was really, uh, you know, recruiting spies into this concept of technology doesn't have to be your enemy. It can really facilitate what you do. Um, and, and he became the godfather of American cyber war. But when he got out, when he retired, what he said to me was, I've spent so much of my career finding vulnerabilities to exploit for offense, for counterintelligence, but no one ever seemed to understand how these could be used back on us. And now I'm very worried that these can and will be used back on us, not just to spy on us, but to shut off the lights one day or to cause an explosion, or to basically pull off another 9-11 only through using cyber means, you know, whether that's hijacking the software on a, on a jet plane or a hack of air traffic control, that kind of thing. And so in the end, our interests were really aligned in getting the story out because we'd really come full circle where, yes, the U.S. had a major first mover advantage, and that was because we learned from our enemy. But now all of these other countries, including our adversaries, had learned from a lot of key US operations that had been exposed and also the hacking of other countries. And really these techniques were coming and boomeranging back on Americans and American systems. Well, in, in your book, you talk about really one of the pivot moments was around 2007 when President George uh, W. Bush uh, seeing a, a, a building nuclear threat in Iran um, under fierce pressure from Israel says, okay, I got to do something. I don't want to go to war, but I can't just do nothing. So he meets with like Keith Alexander, the head of the NSA, who says, okay, let's, let's use our, you know, let's, let's go after Iran. And I want to read one sentence and then have you play off it. You say, for the first time in history, a country could reach across borders and do with code what previously could only have been done with aircraft and bombs. If Iran or any other adversary learned of this new weapon, it would only, almost certainly embolden them to do the same. Mm -hmm. Talk about this moment and really it's how it is sort of uh, really kind of dominates our current current era. Yeah, so the, the, that attack became known as Stuxnet um, by, the, by private industry, by, by Microsoft and others who first discovered it after it got out of Iran systems. And so Stuxnet was something that was widely known in the security community in particular. But I wanted to know, again, the context of it. And so it was really fascinating to go back to that little slice of history, which feels odd to call it history because it wasn't that long ago. But you're right, 2006, I was actually working on Capitol Hill at the time. And if you remember, that's when we were seeing the most, um, you know, the number of American soldiers who were coming back uh, in caskets from Iraq was reaching an all time high. And at the same time, we were already overstretched in the war in Afghanistan. And then we're getting this pressure. And what I what, what people at the NSA told me was it was like a psyop. It was like a psychological operation by Israel to the United States to hand over our bunker buster bombs, because that's what Israel knew they would needed to get through the sheer amount of concrete at this Iranian nuclear facility, Natanz, to really destroy the facility. And without those bunker buster bombs, they didn't think they could do it. So they're pressuring the Bush administration to hand over the bombs. This is Bush's second term. You know, any new war was just politically unfeasible. Um, and so he, he, told, uh, he told Keith Alexander and his generals basically get me a third option. And like you said, 
the third option became this cyber attack. And so what we did was brilliant. You know, this really was the digital Manhattan project. It is still to this day, you know, my big party trick is when someone, when I'm at a party and someone asks me what I do, I said, well, first, let me ask you this question. Have you heard of Stuxnet? And half the time they've never heard of it, but this really was our modern Manhattan project. And what it was, was we got someone, we don't know who, to go into the Iranian and Tons nuclear facility with a USB stick because the whole facility is offline from the rest of the world, plug it in, and it unleashed this computer worm that crawled through Natan systems in search of the computers that control the speed of the rotors at which Iran's uranium centrifuges spin. And that's the pro process by which they enrich, they get enriched. So we basically unleashed this worm and it was very clear to anyone who's ever looked at this code that whoever designed this worm did so with some lawyers standing behind their shoulder, making sure that it only did damage to that exact configuration of rotors and centrifuges at Natanz. And if it got into any other system, it didn't do any harm. So we crafted this worm, it jumped from the Windows computers, the IT systems, into the Siemens computers, the OT systems, those are the computers that control the, the rotor speeds. And then it waited two weeks to make sure it was in the right system, just to double check. And then it began to work. And basically over a period of several months and then years, we would go into the rotors and we'd speed them up for a period, I forget what it was, maybe an hour or 50 minutes or that kind of thing, or it was thir 13 minutes, I forget now. Um, and then we'd sit back and do nothing for several days, sometimes as long as 27 days. And then we'd go back and we'd speed them up, or sorry, we'd slow them down. And then we'd back up and do nothing for a period of several weeks. And we'd repeat this process over and over again. And the goal was to destroy the centrifuges one by one, but to make it look like a natural accident. So Tehran would be none the wiser. And that is what we did. And it was brilliant. By the time it was discovered, we had destroyed about a thousand uh, centrifuges and we had set Iran's nuclear ambitions back years. We also kept the Israeli jets on the ground staved off World War III, um, you know, had made sure that we weren't just sending American soldiers into a third war in the Middle East that we might not win, frankly, because we were so overstretched already. So at the end of the day, it, might, it saved lives. Um, the problem is it got out. Sometime in 2010, we don't know how, it got out. Uh, it got out, it spun around the world. Of course, it didn't do any damage because it had been configured with these lawyers' feedback in mind. But it got into computers all over Asia, India, and it came back on us and it was infecting computers and networks at places like Chevron. Um, and what it did was it really opened up the world's eyes to the destructive potential of code. You know, we knew that code, most, most governments and intelligence agencies knew that code was a powerful spy tool, but I think few really understood the the power of code for destruction. And this was the first time that a country could reach into another country's critical infrastructure, in this case, their nuclear plant, and destroy their uranium supply using code. And our adversaries in Iran in particular weren't admiring the, the careful <laughs> legal components of that code. They were admiring that, wow, we can use code to exact this kind of destruction. And by the way, we know we'll never be able to match the U.S. militarily or in terms of our military budgets, but we know we could actually do a lot of damage to United States systems with code um, because, frankly, you know, we're one of the most digitized nations in the world. We're putting some of our most sensitive data and critical systems online, and all of those systems aren't controlled by the NSA or Cyber Command. They're controlled by private businesses. And some of those businesses are companies like PG&E that have vast amounts of wealth and resources and people and have built up many intelligence agencies of their own staffed with former NSA guys uh, to monitor for nation state threats on their networks and potential cyber attacks. But a lot of them are these small municipal water treatment facilities that don't even think about the fact that a hacker could come in and mess with the chemicals in the water supply and badly poison 
you know, large swaths of the American population. And so that is where we are now. And you see that with ransomware attacks all the time. It's just exposing how vulnerable we are. But a lot of people in positions of power have known about this for a very long time. They just didn't think it was going to blow back on us so quickly when they decided to unleash what was really the, the world's first digital weapon of destruction. And the point you make in the book is that, that the focus has been led by the U.S. very heavily on offense as opposed to defense. And, and you quote this uh, a gentleman, a, for, a retired deputy director of NSA saying, if I were to score cyber the way we score soccer, the tally would be 462 to 452, 20 minutes into the game. In other words, it's all offense and no defense. Is there a way to change that ethos or is that just uh, going to be really, really hard to, to fix? Well, I love that that is the quote you pulled. It's my favorite quote from the <laughs> book, but it's really pertinent right now. And it's very pertinent to your question because the man who said it is Chris Inglis, who's just been nominated to be the United States first ever national cybersecurity director. And, you know, you mentioned his title. He spent most of his career at the NSA working on offense. Um, but, you know, he clearly understands that we have not put any goalies in position <laughs> and we've just all been attacking each other and we have not spent any significant calories on our cyber defense. And so just the fact that he said that quote uh, and is now in this position to really recalibrate America's strategy and rebalance the priorities between cyber offense and cyber defense gives me a lot of hope. Um, but the other thing is, you know, look at where we are right now. Like just in the last five years, and it really took me pulling my head up from my job and writing this book to process what I had just been through, which was I've been like a firefighter jumping from cyber attack to cyber attack to cyber attack. It's really hard when you're doing that to pull your head up and see certain patterns. But just look at where we are in the last five years. Russia has not only tried to hack our elections, you know, with, with, you know, we can debate all day whether it had an impact, but they've gotten into our power plants. D DHS actually published a screenshot that was highly disturbing to me a few years ago, maybe four years ago, that showed that the Russian hackers had gotten their hands on the actual switches at these utilities, that they could have actually turned off the lights. We know that they want to do that because we saw them do it in Ukraine. And when you talk to people in Ukraine, they say, hey, they just did it for a few hours here. We actually think we're just the Petri dish for them. We think you're the end target. They breached our nuclear plant. They breached uh, Wolf Creek nuclear plant in Kansas. They didn't get into the actual uh, industrial controls, but we know that they weren't there looking for some sort of intellectual property to steal. Uh, they've actually gone as far at a Saudi petrochemical plant to dismantle the safety locks at that plant, which is the very last thing that staves off an explosion. Um, so they're messing around with their capabilities. And it's very clear when you, you step back to see what the through line is here. You know, they're testing out their capabilities. They're gaining access to these systems in case they need to detonate something. But perhaps they're just waiting for the right geopolitical trigger to do so. Um, Ransomware attacks are obviously top of the news right now. We don't think that this is Russia proper, but most of these ransomware groups that have been pulling off the attacks on Colonial Pipeline and the JBS meat supplier and our hospitals, like the other week it was the hospital that serves the villages, the country's largest retirement community. Um, they're all based in Russia. Those groups are all based in Russia and are given safe harbor by Vladimir Putin, which is going to come up tomorrow at the Geneva um, discussion, we hope, or we're told. Um, and then China, you know, China's just been carting off our intellectual property for the last two decades. Um, and, you know, sanctions haven't worked, indicting their PLA hackers haven't worked. Uh, and then we're seeing new, new countries come on the scene like Iran, which was just this sort of digital backwater when Stuxnet was unleashed. Now, last year, Iran was one of the most prolific adversaries that the United States faced in the digital realm. North Korea um, they, you know, pulled off these incredibly destructive attacks, but on strange targets like Sony. <laughs> and really what they, they sort of redirected and said, okay, if the West is going to sanction us to death, then we're gonna use cyber attacks to skirt those sanctions by breaking into banks 
and cryptocurrency exchanges and getting the cash we need to skirt sanctions and get back to our nuclear weapons programs. So basically every other country on earth has seen the, the value in a zero day exploit and in these attacks, and they're all using it for their own, um, their own priorities and national security priorities. And a lot of this is coming and blowing back on the United States. And so it doesn't really matter, in other words, that we're the top, the world's top cyber superpower, which I still think we are. You know, no one has pulled off anything close to Stuxnet in the last 10 years, but that lead is closing. And now we're the most targeted nation state on earth and arguably the most vulnerable because we keep plugging in everything we can to the internet. And so it really is urgent right now that we recalibrate the strategy because it's clear that just being the world's most advanced offensive player is not enough to deter our enemies from pulling off their own attacks. And really, I think it's going to be the country that can pull off this sort of cyber iron dome, whatever you want to call it, like a digital Israel, a country that can feel secure when they're surrounded by hostile neighbors and hostile activity that's going to survive the next war. And it's really only been in the last couple of years that policymakers have wrapped their head around the, this idea that we can continue on offense. We don't need to slow down on offense. Um, I think it's a good idea that Cyber Command is hacking into the Russian grid as an act of mutually assured digital destruction to say, hey, you turn off the lights here, we'll just turn around and do the same to you. Um, but I also think if we're going to do that, then you know we need to make sure that our house is all the doors and windows are locked up too. And right now they're all open. Um, and so really the most interesting discussions in government in the White House right now is how do we get everyone to close their windows and lock their doors because the government just can't come in and, and do it for you because so many of these systems are owned and operated by the private sector and lobbyists like the US Chamber of Commerce have been incredibly resistant to there being any laws that mandate that these businesses meet a certain standard of cybersecurity. And so there has been some very clever ways recently to try and get the private sector to take their cybersecurity more seriously. For instance, the Biden cyber executive order that was issued a couple of weeks ago said, listen, we'll come up with a set of standards and we won't even, you, you can self-certify that you meet these standards. We'll take away all the bureaucratic red tape. You self-certify. But if it comes out that you lied to us and that you didn't actually meet this bar that we have set, you're banned from ever doing business with the federal government again. And that is a really important stick because when you think about a company like Colonial Pipeline, where hackers effectively got in because they didn't turn on two-factor authentication and they had an old employee account sitting out there and, and hackers were able to steal the password and get into their systems from there. Um, you know, If they said, we use two-factor authentication and we do regular inventory on our systems to deactivate old accounts, and then Colonial Pipeline's ransomware attack happened, U.S. government would basically say, you're not allowed to do any business with the federal government again. And you know, even though Colonial Pipeline is a private company and, and butts up against a lot of private customers, that's a major pipeline that at places bumps up against federal systems. So it would make Colonial Pipeline unviable if we had that rule in place today. Um, so that, that is a really good start. And it's a really clever way to sort of use the power of the purse to get private companies to take their own cybersecurity more seriously. And that won't stop the really sophisticated stuff, you know, the supply chain attacks and the zero day attacks. But unfortunately, you know, we're at a place where we're not even trying. Like 80% of the attacks that you see in, in the ransomware attacks are the result of a company that, um, you know, an employee's password was stolen and they didn't have two factor authentication turned on or they were using old Windows software that hadn't been updated in 10 years, just the basics. And so, you know, we need to get to a point where clearly the first step is we need to start doing the basics and we're just not doing them right now. Well, Nicole, we received a lot of email questions and, and many of them just play on the theme as individuals. I mean, what can we do? And in your book, you have a couple of dear reader uh, notes that you slip in about uh, having long passwords and other such things. But as, as you talk to students and people in communities, what should individuals be doing 
to protect themselves as, as best they can. Yeah, and it's so hard to not get paranoid when you hear all this <laughs> stuff, but really, you know, sometimes a lot of people who are the most paranoid who, you know, would never use an online bank account, for instance, um, don't realize that they're using the same password across different accounts in, in other ways. Um, and so it doesn't really matter that they're not online banking because they can still so easily get hacked. Um, so the way I think about it is this, you know, my dear readers in the book were just do the basics and the basics are use different passwords across different sites because most of the attacks we see today involve some cyber criminal or nation state getting your password that was stolen from Target or somewhere else that lost it in some data breach and testing it across all of these other accounts and are breaking into your systems and your data, but also your employer's data that way. So use different passwords across different sites. Even better, use a password manager. Unless you're like me and you're really paranoid and then you don't trust password managers. <laughs> but use a password manager. That's the best thing you can do. Turn on two-factor authentication on your email account, on your bank account, on your social media accounts, on your brokerage account, um, on Amazon. You know, do that right now. That is, that is the best thing you can do. You will knock out 85% of the threats we face today if you have two-factor authentication turned on. Run your software updates. You know, when you get those annoying prompts from your iPhone or Android phone to update your software and it takes you off your phone for 10 minutes, like go do a little meditation or go watch your favorite <laughs> Netflix show. Just run your software updates as soon as they become available. And then watch what you click on. You know, don't fall victim to these phishing schemes where hackers send you an email or a text and they pretend to be your UBS tracking info or your employer. Um, and then you click on it and inadvertently give them your password or download malware onto your machine. Okay, that's getting harder and harder as phishing attacks get more sophisticated. But I was actually on the phone with an NPR radio show the other day. And one of the people who called in had this brilliant acronym. They said, I want everyone to remember this acronym. It's email. And it stands for examine messenger and inspect the link. You know, hover over the sender's email and make sure it's actually coming from, you know, nytimes.com and not mytimes.com, that kind of thing. Then hover over the link and, you know, see where that's going to direct you to. And don't click, just don't automatically click on every link and attachment that you get sent or texted. Um, but then the main thing to do, and this is true for American businesses and government agencies, is think about what is the number one thing that you have, and we all have it that if someone hacked it, you would be so screwed. So for me as a journalist, it's my sources. So I'm, I do all the basics and all these things with, with most of my life, but then when it comes to my sources, I am very paranoid. So I use Signal, the encrypted messaging app to trade messages with them. I take my most sensitive conversations offline, which has been harder in the pandemic, but I actually went so far as I have one source that we would meet up once, once a month on the same day each month at the same restaurant we wouldn't bring our devices. I would just bring pen and paper. I would never drive to this meeting and they would never drive to this meeting. I would never Uber to this meeting and they would never Uber to this meeting. We made sure it was walking distance. And that is the only way we felt safe communicating. Um, and so that is, those are the links I'll go for that one thing. Well, for American businesses, your crown jewels aren't your sources. They're usually your um, intellectual property. A Coke, it might be the formula for Coke or your mergers and acquis acquisition strategy. So you take those offline or you put them in a different part of your network that's not easily accessible if some of your employees get fished or you encrypt it. You know, you do whatever it takes to create a moat around that one thing. And for most Americans, it's your personal data and your financials. And you can protect your personal data and your financials by doing the things I mentioned, using different passwords and turning on two-factor authentication and not clicking on links and running your software. Um, but a lot of businesses are getting wise to this and they are doing what's called segmenting or compartmentalizing their most critical data from the rest of their network. Hospitals are moving medical records into a separate part of their network so that if they do get hit by ransomware, um, they can still treat patients or they can still access people's data or they're just backing up that data 
so that it's available on a different part of their network should everything else get encrypted with ransomware. And that's really important because right now we're getting hit from so many sides. You know, it's not even who, who's been hit with ransomware, it's who hasn't been hit with ransomware. You know, it's almost inevitable these days. So you really wanna make sure you're in a better position for when those attacks come. Um, and also, you know, cyber criminals aren't saying, I'm gonna go hack John today. They're just scanning the internet to see who's vulnerable, who's running old software, who's not using two-factor authentication. And when they find you, they'll go through the list and they'll say, oh, he's an interesting target because I know he talked to so-and-so and then they'll hack you. So if you can harden yourself to the point where hackers don't even want to bother with you because it's going to cost them more time or energy, you're going to be in a much better position than everyone else. Nicole, final question real quick. I know because you have to jump on to a CNN uh, program in just a, a minute or two, but we, this is a, call, a question actually from Olga from, um, from Carbondale, who probably is going to ask you, ask about the question you're probably going to talk about on CNN, which is the coming meeting between President Biden and President Putin. Presumably cyber is going to come up and President Biden is going to say, stop it. And Putin is going to say, I'm not doing anything. I mean, what, what, where are we at between the U.S.-Russia relationship, particularly in the cyber realm? Well, it's such a good question. And I have to tell you that in the time we've been talking, I got a message that they just canceled it because <laughs> some other fire hose news has been happening, which I do to people all the time. So sometimes it happens to me. But this is critical. Um, and what, what can Biden say to Putin, not just on the direct tax of our federal agencies and businesses, but on this ransomware issue, because what Putin has said over the years is, oh, he said a couple of years ago, my favorite was he said, hackers, they're just like artists. They get up in the, in the morning and start you know, in a good mood and start painting. I have no say over what they do or don't do. And that's really the problem that we have to solve, which is cyber criminals give Putin and these governments a huge degree of plausible deniability that we don't have here. You know, we use Cyber Command and NSA and other intelligence agencies for our offensive operations. We don't outsource that work to Boeing or Lockheed Martin. We don't tap the guy at Google on the shoulder and say, hey, tonight you're coming to Moonlight for us. So we're actually at a huge disadvantage in this space in terms of plausible deniability. And Russia over and over and over again, we see in when you do the forensics on these attacks that um, you know, the big one was Yahoo, where it was cyber, it was two cyber criminals that did it, but it was also two FSB agents who were basically sitting behind them and saying, if you find a Yahoo account for someone who works at the White House or in the Foreign Service, you pass that to us. But we're going to let you be the ones with your hands on the keyboard. And that's the problem with ransomware. Maybe it is just cyber criminal uh, activity and, and Putin has no say over what they're doing. But the reality is, <laughs> is that they are really doing a good job showing how vulnerable the United States is and creating a lot of panic um, and a lot of doubt in our current administration that they can keep us safe. So they're fulfilling Putin's objectives, even if Putin is not sitting there with, with a whip telling them what to do or don't do. Um, and so how do you get him to take this problem seriously? Well, I have to say that a lot of the recommendations out there, I don't find satisfying at all. I've seen people say he can't show weakness and he really needs to tell Putin that we will respond if he does something. Um, but I would actually like to see much more specific language used. Um, so, you know, we are in Russia's grid. I broke that story a couple of years ago with my colleague, David Singer. We've been hacking the Russian grid and making a loud show of it. But saying, hey, we're in your grid and we could turn your lights off at any moment isn't that big of a threat because of all the things we just discussed because our grid is also vulnerable. So really what I would like him to say is cut it out, get control over these ransomware groups, cut it out with the safe harbor, you know, be willing to extradite them, or we're going to dump all of your financials online showing the extent of corruption inside the Kremlin and we're going to show that the guy that's your, you know, the Kremlin's cellist is actually your best childhood friend. And he's been funneling billions of dollars to you for years. And, you know, what's interesting about that is 
the Kremlin still blames <laughs> the NSA for the Panama Papers leaks. And I don't think it was the NSA because it, it, there was a lot of blowback on US interests too. But that style of operation could create not one Navalny, but thousands of Navalny's. And as we have seen, you know, Naval and Putin really sees Navalny as the number one threat to his rule. The last thing he wants is any kind of insurrection or further pressure from within on his rule. And so if we leak something like that, that shows the depth of his corruption, that could be a real threat to Putin. So those are the things I would like us to threaten, <laughs> because I think he understands uh, what that would look like. And of course, he would just come back and say, well, you know, look at your corruption, look, you tear gas protesters um, in Lafayette Square, you know, you, you know, look at what the police have been doing in the United States, look at systemic racism. And he, th he has been saying those things, but we've just sort of been letting him say it uh, without, without any kind of countermeasure. And at this point, sanctions haven't been a deterrent. Hacking into the Russian grid haven't been a deterrent. Although there is an interesting question, which is, did that deter uh, Russia from hacking 2020? Did it sort of make them pivot towards this more quiet operation that we're now calling solar winds on US intelligence agencies that we sort of consider on the table type intelligence collection, the kind that we ourselves do? So was it a deterrent? I don't know, but it hasn't stopped the ransomware threat. It hasn't uh, led Putin to get a better handle over his own cyber criminals or to be willing to extradite them, that kind of thing. And so if, if, if it's not working, then you have to try something different. And, and I'm hoping they go the route of, we will expose you uh, if you don't cut this out. Well, let me ask you finally then a writer question. I mean, because you've, you've done magazine profiles, uh, you've done daily reporting for the New York Times, this tremendous book, which I would strongly urge everyone to read. It is just amazing array of stories and you, it's an education in the, the, the most enjoyable way possible. But, but you, you also, in one of your notes, you say writing a, a book is a lonely endeavor. You spend way too much time in your own head. So talk about the various different types of writing and which ones, do, which, which, which form is most uh, kind of fulfilling for you? Thank you for that question. You know, I, when I signed on to do this book, I signed on with a different publisher than the one I ended with. And that first publisher said, if you can pay, if you can get this done in nine months, we're going to give you this fantastic advance. Well, that was actually cruel because no one can finish a book on this topic and really do it justice in nine months. It ended up taking me seven years <laughs> and that first publisher canceled on me and I had to go sign up a new publisher who really believed in the project. And so it took seven years and, and that's seven years of you sitting in front of a word doc, trying to figure out. How am, I, how am I going to translate, not just translate really, this really technical subject matter that has such re repercussions for the American public and really the world um, in a way that is going to grab the reader and keep them, keep their attention. And so the books that I kept on my desk as sort of models were Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. You know, Michael Lewis, the Flash Boys is about um, high-speed trading by hedge funds and that kind of thing really technical uh, subject matter that he tells through humans and really a hero's journey. Um, and so to me, that was, that was the, the model. And I needed to do that with the zero day market. And to do that, I needed to tell the story through humans. And it was a lot harder to do, I think, for, with the zero day market, because there are no heroes. Uh, you know, we're all flawed. The NSA has its own flaws. These hackers have their own flaws. The companies like Microsoft, Google, et cetera, have their own flaws. Um, and so, so it, it, it was really difficult to figure out, you know, how to tell this story and, and, and stitch all of these stories together. And my first draft, I wasn't anywhere near the, the, the story. You never saw the word I or me in the narrative. But eventually I realized I needed to be the donkey. No, I'm not going to be the hero, but I'm going to be the donkey. I'm going to have to carry this story all the way through. And so that's why you see me jump in at places and say, here I am at this conference. This place is insane. It's like the most Isley Cantina. It's an uncomfortable. Um, or here I am in Buenos Aires and I'm walking around and I'm realizing 
that just walking around these streets is the first time I've seen a woman in five days because I've been at this hacking conference with these you know, intermediaries and, and arms dealers and hackers. Um, just to sort of bring the reader back and just remind them, okay, I have your hand here and I'm holding your hand and I'm walking you through. And the person that I had to visualize holding their hand all the way through was my mom. My mom's 75. She's, she's, she knows a little bit about technology because we grew up in Silicon Valley, but she's the type of person I was referring to earlier that doesn't want to do any online banking. That just wants to balance her checkbook and, and call it a day. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to take her hand and that was a good person to have in mind also, because another goal of this book was just to process everything I'd seen and really be able to communicate to someone like my mom, what I've been seeing for the last seven years. Um, so I had her in my head. And then the other major challenge was how do I write this logistically? Because every day the news is just getting worse and worse and it's this fire hose and it's never going away. Um, and that was the hardest thing to solve. And I wish I could tell you it was a pretty tale where I really have it all figured out, but it was, it was very messy. And it often, uh, and it often involved me um, putting my baby to bed, you know, at bedtime at six or six thirty or seven, having a glass of wine and then coming out to my garden shed and just writing on, you know, with, with the internet off until 3 a.m., and then going to bed and my husband would pick up morning duty so I could wake up just before work, going to work and doing it all over again. And it was really in the sort of like stillness of the night that I was able to process everything I've seen when you don't have alerts going off on every single device and the news isn't breaking. And it was painful at the time and I was exhausted, but I think I'll always look back on that. Those nights is pretty magical, you know, that just it was really the only time I could understand what the through line was. And frankly, the problem with cybersecurity today is a lot of the discussions happen behind closed doors and classified doors in government. But then in the cybersecurity community in the open, everyone's pretty myopic you know, by nature. They're really focused on the code and rarely do you find someone who could lift their head up and say, wait a minute, we just saw this attack on this, on the safety locks and on our grid and on these nuclear plants and on this French television network by Russia and on the opening ceremony, what are they doing? You know, and, and really it's clear only when you step back that you see where it all leads, but it was really only in this like night, 2 a.m. Um, internet list night <laughs> that I could put together that through line. So it was really lonely and it was really difficult and I wouldn't wish it on some of my worst enemies, but um, now I get to, you know, offer up this book and say, here's everything I've learned. And I hope I did a good job, you know, grabbing the reader. And, and one of the best things that's happened since it's come out is the reviews calling it, you know, riveting and like a spy thriller. That's the best thing that could have happened because that was to me, the hardest part was how am I going to grab the reader's attention about something like the zero day market? And the other thing I have to say is, I mean, I love the self-deprecating humor. You were at some kind of meeting or, or maybe it was a dinner and you made some reference to good Western governments and people looked at you. You said, I slumped in my chair so far. I was hoping no one could see me. So right. I mean, you're presenting yourself as just someone who's trying to figure this out on the go and, and pulling the story together. Yeah. And, you know, it's really a little bit is on my own learning journey, too. Um, I'm not the same person at the beginning of the book as I am by the end. And that good Western government uh, quip I made is really kind of the most telling. This whole time, I was applying this very Western mindset to this space about moral hazards and ethical dilemmas. And then I get to Buenos Aires and I sit down and I say to this guy who knows every hacker who's now selling zero day exploits to places like Iran and China and Russia. And I didn't know this. And I said, so, well, they only sell to good Western governments. And he said, Nicole, uh, we don't really think of the United States as a good Western government here. You know, last time I checked the country that bombed another country into oblivion wasn't China or Iran. And actually you should do some, some homework <laughs> because you actually helped facilitate our dirty wars here. So we actually think of the United States in some ways as the enemy, but really we'll just sell to whoever brings us the biggest bag of cash. And that could be Ghana, or Iran or the United States. And so there is no ethical calculus here. So like go home, sweetheart. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Um, yeah. Great. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for your time. And again, I, I would commend everyone to read uh, this wonderful book. Um, and also, Nicole, when circumstances allow, we'd love to maybe coax you to Southern Illinois. I know you like to get it off the grid. We'll find we're near in the Shawnee National Forest, so we could find some uh, forests for you to, to explore. But, uh, you know, maybe when the book is out in paperback version, talk to students and classes and and just uh, talk about this really important story and translate it to a, a broader public that finds this realm very, very hard to understand, but also really important. Thank you. Yes, I would love to do that. I actually have a lot of family in Illinois and I get out there really regularly. <laughs> so I would love to drop by. So let's stay in touch. And th really thank you for hosting me and letting me tell these stories and um, get this word out. It's it's really important and, and it's it's never felt so important as it does right now. Great. Well, again, thank you so much, Nicole. And we will continue to follow your work in the New York Times. It seems every other day you have another major story there. So uh, there's uh, this, this, this beat is going to continue for some time, I'm sure. Yes, I think it will. It's just how long will I continue? <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We'll have a, uh, this interview on our website uh, in the next day or two. Please share it with friends and family. And again, I urge you to get out and read this book. Uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. It's really terrific reading. Thanks so much, everyone.